Welcome, you're watching ET Now. The show is Startup Central, the first and only daily show in India dedicated to startups and entrepreneurship. I'm Ruchi Bhatia. We've got a power pack show lined up for you, so let's get started. And uh, this, of course, is an exclusive conversation that we had with none other than Nandan Nilekani, the Aadhaar architect, has been very vocal about digital economy and what it means for India. He's voraciously batted for India's tech to solve issues in payments too. He was at a, an event that was hosted by Fiki earlier today and spoke about the new trends in digital economy. Herein. On the people side, uh, I think we have seen very significant developments in the last decade. Uh, of course, Aadhaar is well known and uh, this project is exactly 10 years old. In 2009 it began, we are now in 2019. And 1.2 billion people have the ID. And what's important to realize is that this is a digital ID. So this was developed in the 21st century. So rather than think of it as a paper ID, it's an online ID which you can use to authenticate or verify yourself online using a fingerprint, iris, or, or, or a photograph. And this is a very important uh, capability because it allows a person to use services anywhere over a network on a phone and verify their identity in online. That becomes a very powerful feature, which is especially useful to spread services and capabilities across the country. But what has actually happened is over the last 10 years, uh, Aadhaar being the first, uh, te over the 10 years, uh, many, many elements of uh, digital infrastructure have been created. And these are collectively referred to as the India stack. Uh, the first, of course, Aadhaar, which gave identity and online authentication. But subsequently, uh, uh, working with the Department of Revenue and others, the Aadhaar was designed also to be a KYC or Know Your Customer. Uh, and uh, a Know Your Customer is now an important step, whether you want to open a bank account or get a mobile connection or, or buy a mutual fund or whatever. And uh, earlier, the KYC process was very uh, cumbersome. And many people who didn't have an ID couldn't open bank accounts and so on. So about five, six years back, working with the Department of Revenue under the Prevention of Money Laundering Act, as well as with all the financial regulators like the RBI, SEBI, IRDA, PFRD, and so on, as well as with the telecom regulator, uh, we got, Aadhaar was developed as a universal eKYC or electronic KYC, which allowed you to uh, online do a KYC. So you could give your number and uh, do an authentication, and based on that, you are uh, you could open a bank account and so on. And this was a very powerful feature uh, which was launched uh, about four or five years back. And today, uh, both in the banking and the telecommunication sector, the customer acquisition has been dramatically sp streamlined and speeded up uh, because of this eKYC. In the last four or five years, uh, seeing the rise of e-commerce and mobile payments, uh, NPCI has developed a very modern payment system called UPI. Unified Payment Interface. And UPI is, is really a state-of-the-art payment system, which is real-time, any mobile phone to any mobile phone, any bank account to any bank account. And uh, it's got a lot of features that are not there anywhere else in the world. And UPI has been a tremendous success. In uh, October of 2016, one month before demonetization, uh, UPI did about 100,000 transactions a month. And last month, it did 800 million transactions. So you can imagine the scale of growth in, in less than two years. And of course, during demonetization, uh, it also, uh, the government pushed for digital payments and they launched the Beam application, if you remember. And Beam application is based on UPI. And the design of UPI is something which combines, uh, you know, the banking system with innovation in the sense that the UPI is an open payment rail which any bank can be a member of. So it's an open system in that. And in turn, the banks can tie up with different operators who, who can provide payments on their platform. So Google op provides Google Pay, Paytm provides Paytm, Phone Pay provides Phone Pay, uh, WhatsApp provides WhatsApp payments. So all these guys are providing payments, but behind, the, behind that is actually a bank which processes the payments. And it's this combination of using distribution with payments uh, using the banking system, which is a unique architecture which is not there anywhere else in the world. And this is a very successful way. And people around the world are thinking of this as a possible model on how payment reform should be, should be done. And you know, as I said, it's already reached 800 million uh, payments, 800 million a month in payments, and expect, expected to grow dramatically. So I think 
we have seen a large number of uh, things that have had direct impact on the economy both on the individual side on the and on the uh, on the on the business side so let me now come to the issue of data and so on which is a very important issue i think all over the world now data is becoming central to people it's central to companies and some of the most successful companies today are those that are able to derive enormous value from data similarly it's very central to governments uh, and uh, data is only going to go up in the world because every device you have will generate digital footprint every sensor you have will generate digital footprint so just the data is there's just going to be more and more data uh, more granular more real time more variety uh, you know in the years to come and therefore how do we harness this data to to get some advantage out of it so here again i think uh, india has been uh, pretty unique in in creating an architecture where data empowers people and businesses so it's not just about companies making money from data or governments using data for whatever purpose but individuals uh, benefiting from data and this architecture is called the data empowerment and protection architecture which which is happening and the first this is the architecture itself is sector independent it can work in healthcare or in education or in uh, finance but the first roll out of this architecture is happening in the financial sector and that is happening uh, with a uh, uh, with a new type of entity recognized by the financial system called account aggregators and account aggregator is a standard which has been announced by the RBI but RBI on behalf of all the financial regulators who form part of the FSDC the financial stability development council where all the financial regulators come together under the finance minister so this is actually adopted by all of them and account aggregator is been rolled out right now by both RBI and by SEBI and this allows uh, new institutions come they, there are type of nbfcs which actually help to move data on behalf of a consumer and they can't see the data themselves but they can uh, they they can make money on the transaction fees but not on the data and this it will be used for example if you look at small business with all this architecture now a small business can ask the gst system for its invoice details because anyway you have filed the invoices for the gst so that can come or you can ask the income tax system for your income tax return tds filings the last 6 months or you can ask the mca system for your whatever you have filed with mca and then you can give that the account aggregator gives that to a lender on your behalf so it acts as a, a you know sort of a traffic cop between the data source and the data consumer and this is done on behalf of individuals so this can be both done by individual consumers as well as by businesses and increasingly with more and more data it will be possible for lenders to make decisions on lending entirely on the data so they can actually take a decision to give credit in in a few minutes by looking at all this data which means that you now have an infrastructure where you have digitally enabled data based uh, credit as one example of a use case but the same application can be used in healthcare so you can i can i as a person who's having uh, some issue can ask for my health records from here my diagnostic record from here my, my insurance pay payments from here and give it to somebody else to make a judgment about what healthcare i need so this whole thing is a completely new way of thinking of data where the individual is put at the heart of data and uh, india I, we are able to do that because of three things one is we have this entities called account aggregators which has been recognized by the regulator second is you have infrastructure like aadhar and other things where i can do an instant authentication of identity and then get data on your behalf from somewhere and then because our data regulations also allow for individuals to get their own data back so these are all three different pieces of what's required and that's a very important thing which is happening so maybe I, i'll just uh, wrap up here so fundamentally what we have seen in the last decade is dramatic transformation at the individual level through uh, identity authentication kyc so you can do any transaction any time anywhere and so on dramatic change in payments we have a very advanced payment system now a very modern gst system which is uh, which is completely online real time all that and an architecture for data which i think will set the tone for 
business revival because once data becomes the basis for decision making in many sectors, then you'll see a, a big change. All right, the role of data in the economy and how should data be looked at? That, of, of course, was Nandan Ilekini, the architect of Aadhaar, raising some very pertinent points on data privacy. All right, let's uh, shift focus then. The Supreme Court today has asked the Madras High Court to decide on the interim ban on the video app TikTok by the 24th of April. And remember, this comes in after the Chinese company told the court that the order was passed without even hearing them. My colleague Rahul Dayama is joining in with more details. Uh, Rahul, uh, the Supreme Court now has put the ball back in the Madras High Court's court. How should one really look at it? And this is, of course, coming in after that massive backlash that we saw on social media after the ban of TikTok. Remember, the Madras High Court had really indeed uh, placed a ban, uh, um, citing reasons like uh, it is being used to uh, peddle pornography, could potentially become a ground for sexual predators to become active, and the impact that this would have on children. Because remember, it's a very popular video app, 54 million monthly users, highly popular really in the tier 2, tier 3 cities. Uh, but then we saw the TikTok parent company approach the Supreme Court and say that they weren't really consulted, they weren't heard while the judgment was really passed. Uh, so the Supreme Court has today come out and said that by uh, 24th of April, which is day after, the Madras High Court will have to take a decision on the matter. If they do not, then the ban will be lifted. Remember, uh, uh, we had Google and Apple really uh, take down TikTok only existing users who were accessing it really had uh, access to the app. TikTok on its part has maintained that they've taken down 60 million uh, of the videos over the last uh, 10 months or so. Also, they're just an intermediary and, uh, uh, you know, this really is an attack as far as freedom of speech and expression is concerned. Uh, and the fact that they cannot be targeted over content, which they claim is a minuscule number that the Madras High Court really spoke about. Uh, so, uh, TikTok uh, did put up a strong defense. Also, remember, this episode did trigger an outrage from netizens who said that uh, you cannot ban an app so to say uh, you know is this the way and the repercussions that this would have on the ecosystem going ahead uh, but for now the ball is in the court of the madras high court which will hear the matter on the 24th All right, uh, that was, of course, the Supreme Court uh, asking the Madras High Court to uh, expedite the process to be able to uh, decide as soon as they can on the interim stay on TikTok. Remember, there were issues with respect to child pornography that were highlighted in that petition, and thereafter, uh, the Supreme Court now intervening, uh, intervening uh, and has asked Madras High Court to, in fact, uh, look at the way out as far as this case is concerned uh, and now april 24th is when the madras high court has to get back and respond to what the supreme court has said all right uh, let's quickly shift focus then and uh, the show of course is startup central and uh, it looks like a lot of startups in fact leading unicorns are gearing up to add more heft to their staggering valuations with an imminent round of fundraising my colleague uh, neha botra is standing by with more details neha what are you picking up and this uh, looks like uh, you know while there is going to be a new government that will be coming in place uh, uh, the startup industry is the one that is booming and they are the ones who are uh, getting the big buck release, so to say. You've hit the nail on the head clearly as we have large corporates that are looking to monetize uh, assets to repay debt. You have startups that are looking to raise funds and expand. Uh, in fact, at this point, we are given to understand that three leading unicorns are in line to raise close to one and a half billion dollars. Uh, these include Zomato, Oyo Cabs and also Ola. We are given to understand that 500 million dollars is what they are looking to raise. Uh, Zomato, remember, would be looking to raise funds after Swiggy, its uh, most stiff competitor, uh, raised close to one billion dollars in December last year, uh, taking its valuation up to about 3.3 billion dollars. That's three times what Zomato is valued at. Uh, Zomato valued at one billion dollars. Uh, 
at this point would be looking to have funds to raise market share more in light of the fact that you have the likes of Oreo and even Ola that are eyeing a piece of the pie of this very increasingly rapidly growing uh, food market, the food delivery business to be precise. Um, as far as Oreo is concerned, uh, they of course uh, we are given to understand uh, at this point uh, with a valuation of close to five billion dollars uh, are looking to raise funds uh, considering that they are looking to double their scale and scope of expansions by December this year. This is something that will be a gradual uh, progression we are given to understand. Remember that uh, only recently they raised close to 200 odd uh, million dollars from Airbnb. Ola cabs of course remember uh, will be the center of focus uh, more in light of the fact that Uber that is ready with a IPO of about uh, 120 billion dollars uh, pre-IPO valuation looking to debut on Nasdaq very soon. Uh, of course, so Ola does expect the competition to heat up in India as well in terms of incentives to partners, etc. And uh, all this we are given to understand will be an incentive for Ola as well to have a war chest ready and uh, be prepared for this scenario considering that they are also not very eager to take funds from SoftBank. We are given to understand uh, that uh, as far as Zomato is concerned, uh, one of the lead arrangers uh, is Goldman Sachs. Uh, we'll see how that pans out. Uh, but yes, of course, uh, the communication that the companies have shared with us at this point uh, does not uh, confirm uh, these details. We'll have to watch out how this pans out. But clearly, there is a huge appetite, not just for startups that need to raise funds, but even the funds that are uh, putting in equity and uh, capital into these uh, startups are extremely bullish, uh, considering India to be the market to be in. All right, India the, uh, will be, of course, uh, the market to be, as Neha is putting it out. And looks like the startups are the flavor of the season, even as uh, big political parties, both BJP and Congress, are also all set to woo uh, various startups and make it easier for them this election season. But since we are talking about funding, here's your weekly funding meter that saw some big deals this week. This week saw almost $9 million uh, coming in by startups, largely driven by big fund raised by innovative and raw pressery. All right, time to get you a special conversation uh, with GoDaddy CEO. Joining me now on the show is uh, Scott Wagner, the CEO of GoDaddy. Scott, uh, thanks for talking to us and speaking to us at ET. Now we have seen how you're betting big on India. Talk to us about uh, the growth potential that's there in the Indian market and how big really is uh, India for you? Uh, well, thanks so much for having me. It's great to be with you. and. Uh, the Indian market is exploding in terms of a digital adoption. You know, there's over 460 million online internet users with 90% of them being on mobile. Uh, we at GoDaddy have the pleasure of serving over a million customers up from almost nothing six years ago. Uh, so there's huge opportunity for us to continue to build up the ideas of entrepreneurs all over India and help them get their ideas, not only online, but looking great and successful. Scott, that's definitely an interesting take on India there, but could you also talk to us about what's unique about your customers here? Uh, what are the kind of trends that you've noticed in the recent times in terms of user behavior? Uh, yeah, thanks. Well, I think from a market standpoint, uh, obviously, there's a, there's a dynamic between tier one and tier two and three markets in terms of digital adoption. And we at GoDaddy have 
you know, 80% brand awareness in tier one markets. The bulk of our one million customers come from those tier one markets. And uh, we're really following Indian uh, internet adoption. And so a big focus of ours over the next coming years is gonna be to help enable those tier two and tier three markets uh, get up and running online. Uh, and in terms of our own, the customers that we serve, we're particularly focused on what we call pros, which are those individuals or small firms who help others get up and running online. And so that's the primary focus for the company. So you're currently serving about uh, 10 million customers in India. Are SMEs also the biggest customers? And what kind of potential do you see in the growth there? Uh, yeah, thanks. So for our customers, we're small, I call it small and medium-sized businesses or, again, the pros who serve them. Uh, so typically here in India, you know, uh, uh, our customers are large enough to have a website. And so of those one million customers, uh, you know, we get started with a domain name and we at GoDaddy have uh, over 40% market share in domain names. Uh, and then are focused on not only getting a name, but helping that name turn into online content. And so here in India, for the most part, companies have to not just uh, be a startup, but have some level of establishment to get a website. Obviously, we're focused on serving those customers really, really well and thinking about ways that we can help really ideas just getting started get up and running online. Absolutely, but there's a big traction that we've seen in smaller cities. Uh, has a lot of this come on the back of the massive formalization of the economy post the GST? Of course, the digital push uh, as well uh, that has been there by the government. It's interesting. I think you know, just GST is in you know a relatively early stages of adoption, uh, but it will certainly over the next five years, I think, propel all sorts of smaller businesses to have what you'd call an established presence. And I think there's a real opportunity with an identity formation uh, that will allow a business not only to get up and establish, but allow content uh, to get set up and shared through both the open web, known as a website, and some of the social ecosystems, which here for the most part is WhatsApp. So uh, I think GST is gonna end up being the foundation for a massive wave of not only business formation, you know, in terms of uh, online adoption, but, but really the use of digital services. Absolutely, I totally get your point on that, uh, but help us understand, you know, uh, what are the future big bets that you, uh, you, you know, you're looking at and what should one be watching out for uh, in the coming months from GoDaddy? Yeah, thank you. Well, I think, you know, we have a million users right now. I think our next uh, next million users are going to come from this adoption and focus uh, in tier two and tier three markets. I think the particularly interesting thing for us is how do we get the next 10 million users? And I think that's going to come from a combination of serving these web pros with a deeper array of products and support. Uh, that, that can provide a distinctive value proposition and perhaps bridge this divide between uh, a closed social ecosystem like WhatsApp and, uh, and the open web. So uh, from one to two, I think is uh, pretty straightforward and you know, we're setting our sights high and trying to get to 10 million plus. All right, uh, Scott, uh, many thanks for taking your time out and speaking to us at ET Now and sharing with you your India strategy. And before we wrap up, uh, it looks like Twitter has a new India head, new India MD Manish Maheshwari will be taking over from Balaji Krish, who was appointed as an interim country head after Taranjit Singh quit the company in September last year. In October last year, uh, the, the microblogging uh, giant was scouting for the country director to head the company's operations in India that may have failed to live up to the promise of high advertising sales growth despite increasing smartphones and uh, internet penetration. And in this role, Manish Maheshwari will be leading the company's strategy and execution in India. Remember, he'll al also be responsible for growing its audience and revenue growth in the country. Maya Hari, the Vice President and Managing Director, Asia Pacific, said that on Twitter.
All right, on that note, we're completely out of uh, time on this edition. Many thanks for watching.